What are xenobots? So a xenobot is a self-assembling little proto-organism. Uh, it's also a biological robot. Those things are not um, distinct. It's a member of both how, classes. How much is a biology? How much is a robot? At this point, most of it is biology because what we're doing is we're discovering natural uh, behaviors of these uh, of these of the cells and also of the cell collectives. Now, one of the really important parts of this was that um, we're working together with uh, Josh Bongard's group at University of Vermont. They're computer scientists um, do, do AI, and they've basically been able to use uh, an evolutionary, a simulated evolution approach to ask how can we manipulate these cells, give them signals, not rewire their DNA, so not hardware, but experience signals. So, can we remove some cells? Can we add some cells? Can we poke them in different ways to get them to do other things? So in the future, there's going to be, you know, we're, we're now, and this is this is future unpublished work, but we're doing all sorts of uh, interesting ways to reprogram them to new behaviors. But before you can start to reprogram these things, you have to understand what their uh, innate capacities are. Okay, so that means engineering, programming, you're engineering them in the, in, in the future. And in some sense, the, the definition of a robot is something you in part engineer. Yeah. And, and for, yeah. versus evolve. I mean... Um, it's such a fuzzy definition anyway. In some sense, many of the organisms within our body are kinds of robots. Yes, yes. And yes. I think robots is a weird line because it's we tend to see robots as the other. I think there will be a time in the future when there's going to be something akin to the civil rights movements for robots, but we'll talk about that later perhaps. Sure. Anyway, um, so how do you, can we just linger on it? How do you build a xenobot? What are we talking about here? From from whence does it start and how does it become the glorious Xenobot? Yeah, so just to take one step back, one of the things that um, a lot of people uh, get stuck on is they say, well, uh, you know, engineering requires new uh, DNA circuits or it requires new nanomaterials, you know. what The thing is, we are now moving from old school engineering, which used passive materials, right? The things like, you know, wood, metal, things like this, that basically the only thing you could depend on is that they were going to keep their shape. That's it. They don't do anything else. You, you know, It's on you as an engineer to make them do everything they're going to do. And then there were active materials and now computational materials. This is a whole new era. These are agential materials. This is your, you're now collaborating with your substrate because your material has an agenda. These cells have, you know, billions of years of evolution. They have goals, they have preferences. They're not just going to sit where you put them. That's hilarious that you, that you have to talk your material and to keep yeah, it shape. That's it. That is exactly convince. right. That is exactly right. That is <laughs> Stay exactly there. Right. It's like getting a bunch of cats or something <laughs> and trying to organize the shape yeah. out of them. It's funny. We're on the same page here because in a paper, this is this is currently um, uh, just been accepted in Nature Bioengineering. Mm -hmm. One of the figures I have is building a tower out of Legos versus dogs, right? Yes. So think about the difference, right? If you build out of Legos, you have full control over where it's going to go. But if somebody knocks it over, it's game over. With the dogs, you cannot just come and stack them. They're not going to stay that way. But the good news is that if you train them, then somebody knocks it over, they'll get right back up. So it's all about, right. So as an engineer, what you really want to know is what can I depend on this thing to do, right? That's really, you know, a lot of people have definitions of robots as far as what they're made of or how they got here, you know, design versus evolve, whatever. I don't think any of that is useful. I think, I think as an engineer, what you want to know is how much can I depend on this thing to do when I'm not around to micromanage it? What level of uh, what level of dependency can I can I give this thing? How much agency does it have? Which then tells you what techniques do you use? So do you use micromanagement? Like you put everything where it goes? Do you train it? Do you give it signals? Do you try to convince it to do things? Right? How much you know? How intelligent is your substrate? And so now we're moving into this uh, into this area where you're 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 working with agential materials. That's a collaboration. That's not that's not old old style. Engineering. What's the word you're using? Agential. Agential. Yeah. What's that mean? Agency. It comes from the word agency. So so basically the material has agency, meaning that. It has some some level of obviously not human level, but some level of uh, preferences, goals, memories, ability to remember things, to compute into the future, meaning anticipate. Uh, you know, when you're working with cells, they have all of that to some to, to, to various degrees. Is that empowering or limiting? Having material that has a mind of its own, literally. I think it's both, right? So it raises difficulties because it means that it if you if you're using the old mindset, which is a linear. Um, kind of extrapolation of what's going to happen. You're going to be surprised and shocked all the time because biology uh, does not do what we linearly expect materials to do. On the other hand, it's massively liberating. And so in the following way, I've argued that advances in regenerative medicine require us to take advantage of this because what it means is that 
you can get the material to do things that you don't know how to micromanage. So just as a simple example, right? If you if you, you had a rat and uh, <clears throat> you wanted this rat to do a circus trick, put a ball in the little hoop, you can do it the micromanagement way, which is try to control every neuron and try to play the thing like a puppet, right? And maybe someday that'll be possible, maybe. Or you can train the rat. And this is why humanity for thousands of years before we knew any neuroscience, we had no idea what's, be what's between the ears of any animal. We were able to train these animals because once you recognize the level of agency of a certain system, you can use appropriate techniques. If you know the currency of motivation, reward, and punishment, you know how smart it is, you know what kinds of things it likes to do. You are searching a much more, much smoother, much nicer a problem space than if you try to micromanage the, the thing. And in regenerative medicine, when you're trying to get, um, let's say, an arm to grow back or an eye to repair or sell birth defect or something, do you really want to be controlling tens of thousands of genes at each point to try to micromanage it? Or do you want to find the high-level modular controls that say, build an arm here? You already know how to build an arm. You did it before. Do it again. So that's, I, I think it's it's both. It's both difficult and it challenges us to develop new ways of engineering. And it's it's hugely empowering. Okay, so how do you do, I mean, maybe sticking with the metaphor of dogs and cats, uh, I presume you have to figure out, the find the dogs and uh, dispose of the cats. Um, because, you know, it's like the old herding cats is, is an issue. So you may be able to train dogs. I suspect you will not be able to train cats. Or if you do, you're never going to be able to trust them. So is there a way to figure out which material is amenable to herding? Is it in the lab work or is it in simulation? Right now it's largely in the lab because we are, our simulations do not capture yet the most uh, interesting and powerful things about biology. So the simulation, does, what, what, what we're pretty good at simulating are um, feed forward emergent types of things, right? So cellular automata, if you have simple rules and you sort of roll those forward for every every agent or every cell in the simulation, then complex things happen, you know, ant colony or um, algorithms, things like that. We're, we're, we're good at that. And that's, and that's fine. The difficulty with all of that is that it's incredibly hard to reverse. So this is a really hard inverse problem, right? If you look at a bunch of termites and they make a, you know, a thing with a single chimney and you say, well, I like it, but I'd like two chimneys. How do you change the rules of behavior for each termite? So they make two chimneys, right? Or, or if you say, here are a bunch of cells that are creating this kind of organism. I, I don't think that's optimal. I'd like to, to repair that birth defect. How do you control all the all the individual low-level rules, right? All the protein interactions and everything else. Rolling it back from the anatomy that you want to the low-level hardware rules is in general intractable. It's a it's an inverse problem. It's generally not solvable. So um Right now, it's mostly in the lab because what we need to do is we need to understand how biology uses top-down controls. So the idea is not not bottom-up emergence, but the idea of um, things like uh, goal-directed uh, test, operate, exit kinds of loops, where where it's basically an error minimization function over a new space. It's not a space of gene expression, but for example, a space of anatomy. So just as a simple example, if you have um, you have a salamander and it's got an arm, you can you can amputate that arm anywhere along the length it will grow exactly what's needed and then it stops. That's the most amazing thing about regeneration is that it stops, it knows when to stop. When does it stop? It stops when a correct salamander arm has been completed. So that tells you that's a, right, that's a, that's a, uh, um, a means ends kind of analysis where it has to know what the correct limb is supposed to look like, right? So it has a way to uh, ascertain the current shape, it has a way to measure that delta from, from what shape it's supposed to be, and then it will keep taking actions, meaning remodeling and growing and everything else until that's complete. So once you know that, and we've taken advantage of this in the lab to do some, some really wild things with, with both planaria and, and frog embryos and so on, once you know that, um, you can start playing with that, uh, with that homeostatic cycle. You can ask, for example, well, how does it remember what the correct shape is, and can we mess with that memory? Can we give it a false memory of what the shape should be and let the cells build something else? Or can we mess with the measurement apparatus, right? So it gives you, it gives you those kinds of, so, so, the, so the idea is to basically uh, appropriate a lot of the um, approaches and concepts from cognitive neuroscience and behavioral science into things that uh, previously were taken to be dumb materials. And, you know, you get yelled at in class if you, if you, for being anthropomorphic, if you said, well, my cells want to do this and my cells want to do that. And I think, I think that's a, that's a major mistake that leaves a ton of capabilities on the table.